people and welcome back to the Whiteboard Doctor. For those who are new to this channel, welcome. Uh, we are a free open access medical education platform that uses whiteboard-like teaching to share topics with you all so that we can learn. Hopefully you guys can learn too and we can learn from each other. Um, for those who have uh, been to the channel and are subscribed to the channel, uh, we appreciate the continued support and hope that you're still learning as we are. Um, today we're going to talk about a hematology topic, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, abbreviated HIT. Uh, this is a pretty interesting topic, actually, and it's one you'll come up uh, come upon in the clinical arena, and it's one you'll probably talk about much more frequently than you actually diagnose it in patients who become thrombocytopenic uh, in the hospital. So, uh, hyperinduced thrombocytopenia, uh, we're going to go over an introduction, epidemiology behind it, pathophysiology, clinical features, diagnosis, and management. So, to start, uh, introduction wise, this is an immune reaction. Uh, it's an antibody directed immune reaction towards a heparin and platelet protein complex, which we will go much more into. Uh, that platelet protein is called platelet factor 4. Um, before we dive into that, though, I just wanted to briefly talk about the epidemiology. So, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, it is its incidence is somewhat tough to study, but they divide it up into unfractionated heparin, and the incidence in patients who are on unfractionated heparin is 18 to 17%, and in patients who are on either low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox, fondaparinox, it is 2 to 8%. So you can see somewhat of a lower incidence in patients on low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinux as compared to unfractionated heparin. I do want to delete this because it's important to know the incidence of things just to kind of get a relative sense, but it's not all that important for the rest of the lecture, so I want to continue to have more space. Okay, um, clinical complication-wise, in terms of epidemiology, the big one you think about thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, again, we'll go into that more, um, only about 0.2 to 3% of patients will have one of those complications. So again, lots and lots of patients on heparin in the hospital. You will come across this entity. You'll talk about it a lot, um, but it is not all that common, and the complications that result from it are even less common. Okay, so pathophysiology. Let's do some drawings. So we're gonna use purple here to draw a beautiful rendition of a platelet. Good, so that is a platelet. Um, within the platelet, uh, there's platelet proteins. Obviously, there's a lot of different ones. One that's important here is platelet factor four, and we're gonna draw platelet factor four as kind of a dumbbell. So there's gonna be a bunch of platelet proteins, one of which is platelet factor four. Um, platelet factor 4 is released from the platelet upon uh, by alpha granules. So essentially you have all these alpha granules with platelet factor 4 and they are all released from the platelet upon platelet activation. Um, so you know uh, essentially alpha granules will bind with the platelet wall and they will kick out all this platelet factor 4. So again, these are going to remain platelet factor 4, and these are just out into the general circulation. So all these are platelet factor 4s. So now that platelet factor 4 is in the general circulation, we can draw, this is going to be a blood vessel, and you have all these endothelial cells, right? Endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but these are endothelial cells. And then we have platelet factor 4s floating around in the bloodstream. Platelet factor 4 is a positively charged particle, and because of that cation effect, they will actually bind with glycosaminoglycans, which we can do in blue, glycosaminoglycans, GAG, on the endothelial surface. So what that means, so let's zoom in. We'll zoom in down here. So you have an endothelial cell, right? You have glycosaminoglycans, which I'll draw in blue, and these have negative charges. And then you have your platelet factor fours, which again, I'll draw in green, and these are gonna be positively charged. Uh, this is platelet factor four, and these are positively charged. So what will happen is that the cationic platelet factor fours will all go bind with these glycosaminoglycans, 
on the endothelial surface. By doing so, we actually will displace, and to do that we will get baby blue, displace thrombin. So we're going to say thrombin is this baby blue color, and thrombin, which is prothrombotic, is sitting on these glycosaminoglycans. And when platelet factor 4 comes, you're actually going to release all this thrombin into the circulation. Right? And these are all prothrombotic. So that is the one of the functions of platelet factor 4 physiologically, right? So the platelet is activated, meaning that uh, you want to clot, right? For some reason, the, the bloodstream is telling platelets that they want to clot. So as a reaction to that, they'll release platelet factor 4. And platelet factor 4's goal is to bind to glycosaminoglycans on the endothelial cell wall surface to displace thrombin and then increase the prothrombotic state going on in the blood vessels, um, whether there's, you know, cutting some bleeding or something like that. Um, so that is all physiologic, right? So this, all this is the norm, right? So all this is normal, physiologic. So then what happens when heparin induced thrombocytopenia occurs? So now you have this patient. I'm going to scroll down, get a new screen, and I'm going to get my maroon back. So again, you have your platelet, right? You released your platelet factor 4, but this patient is now on heparin. So what happens when a patient is on heparin? Well, actually what will occur, so heparin will do orange. We're going to draw heparin as these shapes. So this is heparin. And again, this green is platelet factor 4, which hopefully we know by now. Uh, what will happen is actually the platelet factor 4 and heparin will bind together to form a complex. So these will now form... I'll do it a little bigger, a platelet factor 4 and heparin complex. So it's platelet factor 4 and heparin. And now this complex is actually immunogenic to some patients. So some patients have antibodies in their circulation that are looking for this complex. The thought behind this from an evolutionary standpoint is that uh, platelet factor 4 and bacterial cell wall contents can complex as well. So most people will think that uh, the evolutionary uh, adaptation was that these antibodies are specific to platelet factor 4 and bacterial cell walls and that there's just some cross-reactivity with platelet factor 4 and heparin. But nonetheless, um, you will get this platelet factor 4 heparin complex and then you will get an antibody in the circulation. So this is going to be the antibody to this complex. So then what happens then? So actually this entire complex, and we can get a new color here, let's do hmm, a little off blue, which is very similar to the other blue. This complex will actually go back to the platelet and you will get a platelet factor 4, heparin, antibody, complex that will activate this platelet and by doing so the platelet will respond by releasing even more so an even more oh, that didn't work here we go it will just pour out all of these pro uh, procoagulant particles um, so there's a whole bunch of them the names of them aren't really super important but procoagulant particles so this is what happens in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, is that you get release of platelet factor 4, it binds with heparin, the platelet factor 4 and heparin complex is then immunogenic in some patients, and in patients who have that antibody, the antibody will then complex with platelet factor 4 heparin and cause just a huge platelet release of procoagulant particles. Okay, and then obviously those procoagulant particles make the patient uh, at risk for thrombosis. Good. So. Now let's talk about uh, the clinical features. So the clinical features of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia.
So it's one of those things where it can sound a little bit confusing, right? Because you essentially have a prothrombotic state, but your thrombocytopenic. So one of the clinical features is thrombocytopenia, right? And that's usually the one that kind of triggers you to, do we have HIT? But there's no bleeding in these patients. So they're thrombocytopenic without bleeding. Okay, um, something to keep in mind, right, is that when this platelet factor for heparin and antibody complex attached to platelets cause this huge release of procoagulant particles, there is still an antibody attached to that platelet, and that platelet will end up being destroyed by the immune system. Uh, the destruction of these platelets then causes the thrombocytopenia, but these platelets already released huge amounts of procoagulant particles before they were destroyed. So thrombocytopenia without bleeding, given that antibody complex to the platelet, you're also going to often get thrombosis, right? And the thrombosis typically is venous and typically at sites of instrumentation. So I'm just going to write instrumentation here. Instrument. All right. Um, atypically, you can get things like adrenal hemorrhage, which again, this is atypical. You can get gangrene, hemorrhage, gangrene, and skin necrosis, but these are less common. Skin necrosis. Okay. Good. And then the third clinical feature is just a temporal association with heparin, and we'll go more into that for the diagnostic criteria. But these patients, it's the heparin, right? that then complexes with platelet factor four, causing the immunogenic antibody response. So there has to be a temporal association with heparin. Good. So related to this then is how do you diagnose these patients? So um, there's actually the thing you'll always talk about on the floors is the 4T score. So this is important to know because it risk stratifies these patients and tells you where to go from here. So the 4T score uses kind of the diagnostic things we talked about for so thrombocytopenia, right, and it's a point system. So thrombocytopenia, if you have a greater than 50% fall, two points, 30 to 50, one point, anything less than that, zero points, so less than 30. All right. And then the second thing, as we talked about in the diagnostic criteria, is timing, right? You want that temporal association with your heparin. So if it was 5 to 10 days after starting the heparin or less than 24 hours, right, you're going to get two points. The less than 24 hours is going to be patients who were exposed to heparin previously, so they probably already have that antibody response built up, whereas the 5 to 10 days is heparin naive. Um, if this is, like, definitive, they get two points. If it's Probably, so probs this timeline, but unclear, they get one point. If it's less than four days, they get zero points. And this is without exposure, right, because you still have this 24-hour thing. Okay, three, another part of the diagnostic criteria, which is part of the 4T score is thrombosis, right? So um, if there's thrombosis or skin necrosis, we're just going to do thromb or skin necrosis, two points. If there's propagation of previous, oh, this is going to be a P, propagation of previous clot, one point. All right, and if there's none, zero points. Okay, and then the last part, the last T is thrombocytopenic causes. So essentially we say other, because we still want to start with the T, other thrombocytopenic causes. So I'm just going to write thrombo causes, but it's thrombocytopenia. Um, if there is no other thrombocytopenic causes, zero points. If there's maybe another cause, they're consuming their platelets, they're on medications that could, oh, I'm sorry, if there's no other causes, it's two points. If there's maybe other causes, it's one point. And if there's definitely other causes, it's zero points. So how do we use these, uh, the 4T score? So you have your 4Ts, which is thrombocytopenia, timing, thrombosis, and then 
parenthesis other thrombocytopenic causes, and then you add up the points. If they have six to eight points, they are high risk, and in patients with six to eight points, about 64% have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. All right, if they have four to five points, they are intermediate risk, and about 14% of patients have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. If they're less than or equal to three points, they're low risk, and there's less than 1% of patients who in this low risk group will have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So essentially, if they're in the high risk category of six to eight points, you tend to be able to diagnose them with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. If they're in this intermediate category, so we'll say diagnosed, intermediate category, lab assays. So you can order lab assays to confirm that. And if they're less than three points, you essentially rule out RO, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So that's how you diagnose heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. You use the clinical features, and they have developed a, uh, a risk stratification tool called the 4T-score that tells you the probability that they have it, and then you can do an additional workup depending on what 4T-score is. So last but certainly not least is going to be management, right? So you've diagnosed them with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, then how do you manage them? Um, these patients, a lot of them are on heparin because they need it, but you will immediately stop the heparin, stop heparin, and you can start alternate agent, but it can't be a heparin deriva uh, derivative. So start, start alternate agent, but no heparin der derivative, so it could be like argatroban would be an example of one you could start. All right, and then in Europe, there is an approved uh, medication called Derap, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Deraparoid, which is like uh, glycosaminoglycans, which then will help uh, decrease the number of these complexes, right? Because glycosaminoglycans will complex with the platelet factor four so that then heparin can't form the complex. And if there's no heparin, then there's no antibodies, which means there'll be no heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, but this is only available in Europe. It's not available in the States, at least as far, I'm as, far as I'm aware. So the management is pretty simple, right? Stop the heparin because that's the uh, uh, agent that is causing issues and then start an alternate agent that is not a heparin derivative. All right. All right. So that is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, essentially, you have platelet quick summary at the end. I tend to like to do that. Uh, platelet factor four released in alpha granules. Uh, the goal for platelet factor four physiologically is to bind with glycosaminoglycans, displacing thrombin. The displacement of thrombin is then a procoagulant, uh, but it's the physiologic appropriate response because platelet factor four is released when there's a bleeding problem. The issue, though, is that when you're on heparin and platelet factor 4 is released, heparin and platelet factor 4 will form a complex. This is an immunogenic complex. Once an antibody binds, it will then go back to the platelet, cause a huge release of procoagulant particles, and then destruction of that platelet through an antibody-induced response. So you get thrombocytopenia because of the destruction of platelets. You get thrombosis because of that massive release of procoagulant particles. Um, and then you need a temporal association with heparin to stratify. We use the 4T score. Depending on the number of points a patient gets, we'll stratify them whether it's a diagnosis or they need additional workup or if it's ruled out. And then to manage it, you just stop the heparin, which is the offending agent, start an alternate anticoagulant presuming that it is indicated. And then in Europe, again, I don't have much exposure to this, but there's a medication, which is essentially a slurry of glycosaminoglycans that is meant to uh, inhibit the platelet factor four and heparin complex and thus inhibit the uh, antibody response to that complex. All right, I know that was a lot. I appreciate your time. Hope you all learned something. If you want to subscribe for more videos, please feel free. Um, if not, we appreciate you walking. Please walking, watching. Please leave any questions, comments, concerns. We'll do our best to get back to you and hope you all have a great day.